Ben, if I wanted to hear a podcast between you and Justin Koo talking about life, love, and other mysteries, where would I go to find this podcast? You would definitely go first to the internet. If you don't know how to use the internet, you'd open your web browser, Google Chrome, uh-huh. Mozilla Google Firefox, Chrome? something of that sort. Safari? And then you would go to Justin Koo's Instagram, which is at J Koo. And then there's a link. <laughs> I don't know, I think. That's probably the worst way to find the podcast, I would imagine. Like, you could do that on your phone, Oh, right? Yeah. These people are never going to find the podcast, and that's cool because that means you probably won't get canceled because no one's going to listen. <laughs> it's crazy is that th- all three of us do podcasts and we can't figure out what to say. Well, hey guys, this has been very helpful. I'm excited <laughs> to, to, to listen to the Dusty Boys podcast. Count me in. Welcome again, everyone, to Worthy of Everything. My name is Jadra Lazo, and our special guest this evening is Miss Floor Just. Uh, she has a beautiful testimony of how the gospel changed her life. And just a heads up, today we are going to be referencing Floor's testimony that she shared on another podcast called Death to Life. Her story personally had a big impact on my life and gave me a lot of encouragement in my marriage. Her and her husband went through some really hard times in their marriage, and the miracle of how he individually transformed their lives and, as a result, their marriage is definitely a story worth checking out. So part of her walk of faith that we will discuss today will include how God invited her to share her testimony in a very public way. So, yes, beloved Floor, what has life been like since Jesus transformed your life and opened your eyes to the truth about the gospel? Okay, let's talk about that. Yeah, so the aftermath of death to life. I knew that I was going to be on this podcast before anyone ever asked me to be on it. It was a conviction from the Holy Spirit, honestly. I knew and I felt that God was telling me, you have to share your story. And so I knew that time was going to come. I just didn't know when. And so all I did was I asked God, I said, Father, I don't want to record this until my dad retired because my dad was and is a pastor. And so sharing everything that I shared, my testimony and everything that happened, I didn't want that to be, I didn't want it to stain my dad's reputation or affect him in his ministry at all. I love and respect my dad so much. I wouldn't want to hurt him in any way. And so I prayed and I asked God to basically make the timing perfect. And sure enough, my dad retired in June of that year. And Richard called us to do the podcast in like August and we recorded it in September. So my dad had been retired at the time, but I remember feeling like, okay, I can do this. Like it's going to be out there. And I knew the waves it was going to cause, but at least I, I respected my dad enough to not want to take his name. Right. So I did that. And here's why I share that story because Later, maybe like, I don't know, four or five months later, my dad came out of retirement and went back to the ministry. And so God told me, yeah, I hear I was waiting for this perfect time to share my story and whatever. And God was like, girl, it's always a perfect time. (laughs) Don't wait for a specific (laughs) moment or for the stars to align or yada, yada, like tell people about my goodness. Right. And so it ended up not mattering. Like what we think is perfect timing is not God's perfect timing. But yeah, just a lot of things have happened since the podcast has come out. Um, My episode anyway, good things and bad things. I -hmm. knew that I was going to get a lot of uh, hate from people. I mean, you're putting yourself out there for people to judge and think whatever they want of you. But that's not why I shared my story. I shared it to show this like testimony of God's love for me and his transformation in my life. So as many bad things have ha- as have happened, a lot of good has come out of my episode. And so I don't regret it one bit. I'm so glad I recorded it. Everything that was said was perfect. So yeah, and I just want to affirm that because... 
literally, I can't say it enough. Your testimony had such an impact on me and was a story that I shared with so many others because it really shows how far we can drift and yet the Holy Spirit can turn everything around. I mean, we're talking emotional affair, partying, burning man, giving up on your marriage and so much more. And it's a story that can give hope to the hopeless. And the reality is that the Bible has the craziest stories, things done by God's faithful people. And it's incredibly meaningful when it's someone alive right now, someone I can say, listen, I actually know this person and their life was just radically transformed. Jesus can turn things around for you too. Yeah. And it's relatable. Like, mm -hmm. like, let's be real. Like we live in a world that is full of sin and it's real. And it's just mm -hmm. one story of the millions. But I know that there's people out there that have related to it. My story is very triggering to so many people, but ultimately the good has outweighed the bad. And that's why I shared my testimony. And I also wanted to share that just to illustrate the point. So it was maybe like a couple months after my episode aired. And up until recently, it was like the third most downloaded episode out of like, I don't know how many, because it's so juicy and like, it's crazy. <laughs> and it's funny because my husband always said, people will start listening to your episode for the dirt. They're, they're going to come for the dirt, but then they're going to oh, yeah. end up in the clouds because jokes on them. Right. This is going to get it them, always leads to feet Jesus. Wet. Yeah, <laughs> it always leads to Jesus. <laughs> yeah. So a few months after it aired, one of my cousins called me, somebody who I'm not really close to. He called me at work and was like, I need to talk to you. And here I was thinking that he was calling to see how I was doing. But no, he wanted to give me mm -hmm. an earful of like my episode because obviously he had heard it. Mm -hmm. And it was 15 minutes of he just chewed me out, like Aww. straight chewed me out for 15 minutes. Like mm -hmm. I couldn't even say anything. And in that moment, God told me like Holy Spirit was like, just let him talk. Let him vent. Don't mm -hmm. say anything. Don't defend yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I let him talk and he called me all sorts of things and, you know, said all sorts of mean, ugly things. And he was just trying to defend my dad because he loves my dad. You know, that's his uncle. I saw that and I was empathetic to that. But when I hung up the phone, I was just devastated because he missed the whole point of the podcast. He missed the whole message of why I even right. shared my testimony and so I called one of my like spiritual mentors and I was like crying and I was like, oh my gosh, you just said this, this, and this, and yada, yada. And he's like, welcome to the kingdom of God. Mm. Welcome to being a follower of Christ. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, this is what, this is what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> I just was not prepared. <laughs> What? I thought this was going to be a downhill road with rainbows and butterflies. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I had that same moment. Yeah. So um, there's that on one side, right? And then mm -hmm. a few months later, I get a phone call from this stranger who lives in Tennessee. We have a mutual friend who I wasn't even close to in college who somehow heard that I recorded a podcast episode, listened to it and sent it to her right away. And she was listening to it at just the right time. And as she listened to my story, she could relate to me and some of the stuff that had happened to me. And so she herself was going through an affair at the time. And mm -hmm. my testimony convicted her so much that she decided she wanted to end her affair. Yeah, reconciled with her husband. And wow. I even flew out to the middle of nowhere, Tennessee, to uh, surprise this girl. I got to watch her get rebaptized and renew her vows with her husband. And God was present in that place. And the spirit yeah. of reconciliation was there. And I just remember like thinking to myself, this is why I shared my story. This is yes. why God wants me to tell people, be transformed by the renewal of your mind, you know, and the power of your testimony. There is power in testimony. So lots of good has come out of it for sure. That's so beautiful. It's so interesting hearing you share that. It's like you have this experience where somebody's like, oh, just speaking all the negative. But then God always encourages us. And so, yeah, that's such a beautiful encouragement that their lives were so transformed by that. 
So yeah, let's just continue. I know that uh, you shared about your struggle with endometriosis in the podcast and you have pretty severe condition. And so let's just dive into talking about your health and um, infertility and just how God has been guiding you through all of that. Yeah, for sure. So my women's health, or I guess my endometriosis or my infertility is a huge, plays a huge role in my testimony and in my story, because it was the one straw that broke the camel's back. Mm-hmm. In my case, I had been circling the drain for some time, making bad decisions, living in, in the world, doing things of the flesh, having one foot in church, one foot, you know, out in the world, being double minded in so many things. But always feeling like I was better than everybody, right? Like pride, right? All that. But it was my endometriosis that really just was the catalyst to just my world falling apart. So yeah, I wanted to speak to that a little bit because I know that I'm not the only one who struggles with infertility. It doesn't even have to be like PCOS, endometriosis or anything like that. It could be any other kind of disease. Like I know I'm not the only one. Yep. But there is something to be said about women carrying this burden alone because it's something that is not talked about enough. It's just, it weighs heavy on my heart because I know that there's so many women out there who struggle and who are doing it alone and who are suffering alone. So when I got the diagnosis, it just shattered my world. And the reason why it shattered my world, Deidre, was because I identified with that. Like Mm. I let it define me. My life was going great. Everything was perfect. Sure. I had a sexless marriage. I didn't understand why. Like, sure. I wasn't Mm -hmm. nice to my husband. Like, sure. I knew I was living in sin, but like sin is fun. I was just having a great time doing all of that. That when the doctor told me like what my future was going to look like and my life wasn't actually perfect. I identified with that. And that what started it all. And it happened like that. It happened so fast. Just my decision to like, to just live my life, you know, YOLO, right? To just throw Mm -hmm. caution to the wind and just be like, I'm going to do me. I'm going to do whatever makes me happy. And then going to that party and meeting this girl and pursuing a relationship with her. Mm -hmm. It all happened so fast. Like I got the diagnosis on October 10th. And then by like mid-December, I was having a full-fledged affair with another person who lived in another state. I mean, it was an emotional affair, but still, it doesn't matter. It's innocent. So um, it's just crazy. It just happened so fast. So it's like, yeah, you just, it ripped away like this lie that you, you know, I have this great job. I finished school. You know, John and I can travel and do all these things and party and mm-hmm. are things perfect? No, but you have this like facade that things are so perfect. And then that just like ripped that away from even your own personal beliefs. And so it's like Satan just pounced on that. Mm-hmm. And I have to be honest with you, Jadra, like, I didn't want to have kids. I was having a blast living life Mm. with just my husband and I doing whatever we wanted, whenever we wanted. Like, I didn't even want kids until I was told you might not be able to have them, Mm. you know? And so so interesting. It it is kind of interesting how that all happened. So did God, like, after the transformation of learning your identity in Christ, like, was there a moment where... God just put this overwhelming desire in your heart to have children. Mm-hmm. Yes. Like it started a little spark of like, what? I want what I can't, I'm told I can't have. Like, mm-hmm. okay, I want that now. Mm-hmm. But like, when did he grow that? Mm. So I'll tell you exactly the moment it happened. So this was during what I call double D, basically the divorce debacle between John and I. I wanted to leave mm-hmm. him one day, then the next day I wanted to get back together with him. You know, mm-hmm. I was looking for divorce lawyers on one day, but then the next day, I was asking him to come to Burning Man with me. It was just, it was just a hot mess. Like I didn't know Mm -hmm. who I was. I didn't know right from left. Anyway, during that time and after I went to Burning Man, I went to Costa Rica to visit family. Like I had said in my episode, I needed community. I I needed someone to just hug me. And I wanted my grandmother Mm -hmm. to hug me because she like, Mm -hmm. my grandma's just so wonderful. Anyway, as you know, uh, my mom made me go to the doctor and we found a specialist and he's like yeah we can do surgery tomorrow and I was like the heck I'm only here for the weekend like it was really like crazy 
So we did the surgery and it was actually before we had the surgery at the consultation in his office, he was like, do you want to have children? And I was like, well, I didn't know how to answer that because I didn't want to say yes, because I Mm -hmm. knew that like that was sad to say yes. Mm -hmm. But then I also didn't want to say no, because that wasn't true. He was like, let me tell you something. He pulled out a Bible and was like, do you believe in God? And I said, yes, I believe. I believe in God. And he's like, wow, that's so good. Well, let me tell you something. I have performed surgery like endometriosis surgery on so many women. And I have seen endometriosis really bad in some people and not so bad in others. What I say doesn't go. No doctor can ever tell you whether you can have children or not. Only God can. Mm. And I was like, wow. Yes. (laughs) Wow. That's even before you, before I received freedom, before I had my conviction, before I had, you know, my Saul to Paul moment. He was like, Mm. do you believe in God? Well, let him tell you what's up you know amen like only he can say yes or no right and I was like oh damn like okay yeah you're right so in that moment I just kind of realized like yeah science might say or doctors might say like you're going to have a, a challenge because no one I have to be clear no one has ever told me Floor, you're infertile, you cannot have children because right. medical professionals are very careful about absolutes right but I'm not dumb. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I'm in the medical field myself. I know my body. I can see what's happening. I have an idea of my status and where things are at. I'm realistic, right? But they're always very careful and kind of dance around that, right? And they always just say, well, it's going to be a challenge. Well, maybe you should consider IVF. Well, you might want to start going to a fertility clinic, et cetera, et cetera, right? But this doctor in Costa Rica who didn't know me from, he didn't even have any of my, like my chart. He knew nothing about my medical Mm -hmm. records or anything. He was like, do you believe in God? Yes or no? spoke life over you. Yes, he did. so beautiful. He did. And he ended up doing my surgery anyway. So yeah, it was in that moment that I realized like, no, my story does not end here. And God will decide whether I'll become a mother or not. And I, I didn't at that moment. I don't want to identify as somebody with infertility. I wanted to be, to be clear that that was not going to define me. So that that was before finding freedom and finding Christ that I knew that that was not the way, you know. And and I wasn't going to let that be me. So fast forward to you know my moment with God and the reconciliation of my marriage and. Um, all these beautiful things that have happened since. That desire that God put in my heart in Costa Rica has just grown, you know, over time. And he has slowly but surely been preparing me for motherhood. He wants me to be a mother. I know he does because he's told me. And I, I feel very strongly in my heart that I will have children someday. I'm praying for twins specifically. And um, here's why. So I have, as we know, endometriosis, but I also have adenomyosis, which is when the lining of your uterus or endometriosis starts to grow within the muscle of your uterus. So that creates its own complications for pregnancy. And it's just another cause of infertility. But not only that, I have the trifecta. My uterus is not shaped normally. It's supposed to be like a hollow triangle of sorts. Mine is a heart. It's called bicornuate uterus or something like that. There's a scientific term for it. So you would think like, oh my gosh, how cute a heart. Like, no, actually, um, (laughs) not not necessarily a good thing. That's also not a good (laughs) thing for pregnancy. But it is kind of cool. It is kind of cool. You have a new heart in Christ and you have a heart-shaped uterus. Who knows? <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. I can't believe I'm like on a podcast talking about my uterus, but but it's true. Like, leave it to me. Like, I'm so extra that even my uterus is like, I'm going to be different, you know? <laughs> yeah. I have the trifecta. But even then, I was just, God gave me this like vision of like this little heart, right? Like, yeah, it would be hard for a baby to fit in there. But also, like, if you look at it, if you look at a heart, it's two halves. And I know that two little babies can fit perfectly in that heart, you know, one in each half. And so that's what my my husband and I are praying for. That's so beautiful. Yes. Yeah. So that's that's where we're at. 
But I can't talk about infertility without mentioning the story of Hannah in the Bible. Oh my gosh, I relate to her so much. Hannah, as you know, is or her story is found in 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 1 tells the story of this woman who struggles with infertility. But not only that, she was a woman who was provoked by her rival, Penina, who mm-hmm. had kids. Who also that mean was, girl. Oh my that gosh. mean wife. <laughs> he was horrible. It was also her sister wife, right? She would like provoke her until mm-hmm. she would stop eating and be depressed because she had kids, but Hannah didn't. Like mm-hmm. how horrible, you know? And if you read 1 Samuel 1, 6, it says her rival would taunt her severely just to provoke her because the Lord had kept Hannah from conceiving The Lord closed Hannah's womb. Mm. And that stuck with me because it wasn't so much that her body was just rejecting its natural design. It was that God chose to close her womb. It's very clear. It even says it in the verse before that. Elkanah, her husband, would give her a double portion because he loved her, even though the Lord had kept her from conceiving. So God's Mm. hand was all over that, right? And so like sometimes God allows us to suffer and it's hard to understand why, you know? Sure. And like if you read the story of Lazarus in the Bible in John 11, now Jesus left Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Mm -hmm. Like Jesus, don't you love Lazarus? Like why didn't you just hurry up and get back? You know, Mm, go heal him. him. Go (laughs) heal him. (laughs) Mm -hmm. He's your bestie. Like, why did you wait and stay not one but two days longer? Yeah. It's because God is sometimes slow to answer our prayers, right? He's Mm. slow, but he's on time. I'm just so convinced that there are times when God will leave us in suffering because he cares more about our character than our comfort. Mm. God ultimately is sovereign. He's perfect and he's holy. He does what he wants to do when he wants to do it. But because he is good, we can trust that his timing is perfect. So why did he close Hannah's womb? I don't know. Like only God knows, right? But Mm -hmm. could it be that maybe Hannah wasn't ready for a child? Could it be that maybe her heart wasn't postured correctly to receive this Mm -hmm. blessing? Like, I don't know. And that she wouldn't have promised Samuel had she not suffered that because she, you know, she ended up promising Samuel as yeah to God, right? Yeah, and so, he became a Levite. And yeah. he became an amazing prophet. Yeah, who anointed kings and other prophets, right? Like God had a special plan for Samuel. But yeah, Hannah suffered for years. How do I know it was years? Because the Bible says that Penina provoked her for years. Her sister wife, like she suffered for years. And as far as my story, I have had, I'm pretty sure I have had endometriosis since puberty. Mm -hmm. I just didn't know about it. And so in a way I have suffered with this disease that was unnamed until October 10 of 2019, Mm -hmm. or sorry, it was 2018. I suffered for years with this and it affected my marriage. You know, like we basically lived in a sexless marriage and obviously that's going to affect my husband and the way he views Mm -hmm. himself and the way he viewed his his worth. It's going to affect me and the way that I viewed myself. It plays such a huge role in my story. But anyways, back to Hannah. One thing I loved about her was that she was genuine and vulnerable with God. Yeah. The Bible says, 1 Samuel 1.10, like, Hannah prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She told God how she felt. Even if she didn't verbalize it, in her heart, she let God know that she was suffering. But what I love the most is her vow. So if you read 1 Samuel one eleven, it mm-hmm. says, making a vow, she pleaded, Lord of hosts. If you will take notice of your servant's affliction, remember and not forget me and give your servant a son. I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and his hair will never be cut. Beautiful prayer, right? But what caught my attention was how she started it. Her first words out of her mouth were, Lord of hosts. This is the first time the Lord of hosts is introduced in the Bible. And it came from the prayer of a barren woman. Like, how beautiful is that? 
Wow. That she like spoke out to God and named him Lord of hosts, which means Lord of heaven's armies, the God that is above everything and everyone, and anything, including my womb, right? Her womb. I'm just reminded of that, that the Lord of hosts is my father, right? Amen. And Hannah was depressed and she was sad and she was grieving mm-hmm. and I've been there, but yep. Hannah didn't stay there. And I didn't stay there because the Lord of hosts is my father. And ultimately, what he says is better over my life than what I want. So a lot of times we pray for things that we have no intention of giving back to God. You know, Hannah was able to walk away from this prayer with a different posture in her heart and allow that if you give me this child, I will give him back to you. Sometimes the miracle isn't in our prayer being answered but it's in our faith growing while we wait. One of my favorite authors says that. And it's so true. Romans 5, 3 says, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. Amen. I just, I love that so much. And James 1, 2 through 4 says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know, that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So what is God trying to teach me in this season of waiting, in the season of suffering? He's teaching me perseverance and endurance and character mm-hmm. and hope. I know that one day God will give me a gift of children, but the posture of my heart is different now. Now I know that the giver of the gift is better than the gift itself. Maybe if John and I would have had children back when we got married in 2010, like well, our kid would have been 12 years old. I, I cannot imagine myself with a 12-year-old kid personally. <laughs> um, but maybe things wouldn't have turned out that well. Maybe I would have made my child my idol. Maybe I would have traumatized him or her in some way, you know, because of just the selfishness that I lived in and in the pride that I had. Like, who knows? All I know is that God is better than anything and anyone my heart has ever desired. And that includes children, which Amen. are a blessing from God. But like, God is better than the blessing, right? That's right. And yes. so, yeah, if there's anybody out there who has struggled with any of this, I just hope they're encouraged. That's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. It's it's so cool. I listened with my children. We listened. Shout out to yourstoryhour.org if you have children. It's amazing. They do one free story a week, but we download a lot of them and listen all the time. And we listened to the story of Hannah yesterday. And <laughs> it's just so interesting that you brought that up. Like I get really into the stories, probably more so than my kids sometimes. And I'm just like, oh, it's so beautiful <laughs> when she was crying out to God and Eli thought she was drunk and just how mean Panina was to her. And Ugh, like you said, Panina. like we don't have to stay in that place of depression mm-hmm. because we get to speak the truth. We get to hear the truth spoken to us by the Holy Spirit. And we get to claim that truth over our lives. We get to choose to see God is good and know that, like you said, he always has our best interests at heart. Like mm-hmm. he is better than the things we want. Even if it's something I really want, it might not always look that way later, but my desires will line up with his desire for my life. And I will be grateful because I know he's good and I trust him. And so thank you for sharing that. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. And you heard it here, guys. First, I just, I feel so strongly that God's going to give us children. So when that does happen, you can say, oh yeah, I remember talking about that. That's faith, guys. Oh, man, that is faith. Girl, (laughs) that is so good. Yeah. So, um, well, first of all, is there anything else you wanted to say about your health before we move on? Man, here's the takeaway message. Like our bodies are here on this earth and they're paying the debt of sin. They carry that. From the moment we're born, we're headed Mm -hmm. towards debt. Mm -hmm. And that's okay because what's really important And what matters is my soul and my spirit. 
And I have started to look at my body differently because my body houses the Holy Spirit and what a temple that is. Like I finally understand that, like how beautiful it is that this bag of bones houses the Spirit of God. And so as many struggles as it has given me, as many sleepless nights and tears about all my health issues that I have had, I'm thankful because God gave me this body. And so if anyone is out there like struggling with health issues, like just be encouraged in knowing that your body houses the spirit of God too. So be kind to us. So yeah, let's just talk about um, the cost of following Jesus and what that has meant for you. Oh my gosh, is there not a cost? Hello, yes. (laughs) You know, I wish someone would have sat me down like even before I recorded my death to life podcast episode and just kind of read to me Luke 14 because I had to learn the hard way that following Jesus comes at a high price. I think we should just read it. So let me let me find it yeah, and read it to you. It. Um, Luke 14 mm-hmm. says, Now great crowds were traveling with him. So he turned and said to them, he's talking about Jesus, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And then it starts to talk about how like it compares following Jesus to like building a tower and then like running out of money halfway through the project Mm -hmm. and how like onlookers could make fun of it and say, oh my God, look at Floor. She started that tower and didn't finish it. What an idiot, right? Like she ran out of money. And then it compares it to also being a king going to war against another king, but not for sitting down and deciding whether or not he has enough men to fight this other army. The chapter ends by saying, Anyone who has ears to hear should listen. And I just was naive to the fact that following Jesus will cost us on this side of heaven. Mm -hmm. For me, it has cost me a lot, actually. I have lost relationships with friends. I have lost relationships with family. I don't have the best relationship with my parents. We don't see eye to eye when it comes to like certain theology anymore. And yeah, it has... It has been a struggle. I'm not going to lie. I want people to know that finding Jesus and finding freedom isn't easy. God doesn't promise us rainbows and butterflies and health and wealth. This is not the prosperity gospel. Like God is good and he takes care of us, but there is a cost to following Jesus. I just find comfort in John 16:33, where he says exactly the verse I literally... <laughs> What I was thinking really? of. Yes. I it's literally look oh on my, gosh, my phone. You have it up. You have it up. Okay. Yes. Oh my gosh. This is one of my absolute favorites. Read it, girl. I have told you all this. So this is Jesus speaking. I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. Oh. Mm. But take heart because I have overcome the world. Yes. Amen. I just love that so much. And honestly, like brings oh, tears so to my good. eyes because yes. like God is so good. He's so good that he like told us in advance, you will suffer on earth, but take heart. I have overcome the world. I have suffered not just physically, but emotionally and with my relationships. But at the end of the day, I'm good. Like I'm still yeah, good. Peace. I have peace. You have joy. I have, you have joy. love. I have love. I have and the, the list goes the on. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. I have all of that while still not leading a perfect life mm-hmm. or, or whatever. That's okay, man. I'm good. I'm so mm-hmm. good. Something that I've said, you know, over and over, and this is just like a phrase that love reality, love reality likes to say, you know, feelings aren't Lord. Jesus is, right? And I have to mm-hmm. remind myself that the whole lot. Oh, me too. I can go through this difficult season, feel the feels, but I don't stay in it. We have this hope. Our circumstances don't define us. Our relationships or lack thereof 
don't validate us. Our worth doesn't come from others or our accomplishments or our failures or our biggest mistakes. The Bible is so clear in who we are. That's what gets me going every day. Like I just have to be reminded of who I belong to and my identity in Christ. And with that, I can face anything. I really see feelings more like a compass now. It's like, you know, especially as women, not saying that men can't totally get in their feels. We know they do too. Mm -hmm. But it's like, I am a woman. I have all these feelings. I will always. And sometimes these feelings are just absolutely beautiful things. But it's a compass because when I feel stress and worry and, you know, anxiety or maybe I'm feeling bad, like, oh, I wasn't a good mom today. Like I, you know, I yelled at my kids, whatever it is. It's like, okay, but what's the truth? The truth is that I have been given every spiritual blessing from above, that I am lacking in nothing, that my heavenly father has literally sent his son died and freed me from sin mm -hmm. and I get to live in the fullness of his love, joy, and peace. And and when I look at that and I practice, I put that into practice and exercise my faith and form those new patterns of thought over my old patterns, right? Like, mm -hmm. is life easy? No, life is really hard. But is life filled with peace in Christ? Absolutely. Yes, Absolutely. it is. It is. I, I said this before, I used to be happy, you know, because living in sin, like I said, is fun. And like, I was happy, but I didn't have joy. And there's a mm. huge difference between happiness right. and joy. Happiness can be transient. It could be here today, gone tomorrow. I could be happy one second and the next not, you know, <laughs> you can party all night and have a good time with your friends. And then the next day you're like, oh, uh. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But joy, I get to live in that joy. I get to sit in that. And no one can take that away from me. Like, that's right. What a gift from my father, you know? Like, that's so beautiful. I love what you said about like having life and having life abundantly. John 10 10, one of my favorite verses. I came that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Like, freedom in Jesus means having life abounding in the fullness of joy and peace. Mm -hmm and strength mm -hmm. in the spirit, just not living from a place of lack, which is how I used to live, you know, before I met Jesus. I've been reading First John. Actually, I read it all in 30 minutes. It was just so good. And I'm trying it's to read so the Bible good. chronologically, and I'm not to the New Testament yet. But I don't know, just at church this past Sabbath, I just started reading it because I'm not going to lie, the sermon was like, not it. And I was just so... <laughs> I was just so blessed. I'm like, man, it happens. There's... It happens sometimes. Listen, let's keep it real here. Like, sometimes you just gotta open the word. Okay, you just gotta read your Bible. You just gotta read the Bible during it's... the sermon. Yes, sometimes <laughs> you just got to. <laughs> Anyways, I read First John three, and I had read this before, like so many times, but like it hit me different this past weekend. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we should be called the children of God. Behold it. Just think about the love that God has given us. Like, when I think about my own life and the love that God has shown me, like, I can't. I can't talk about it for very long because I start to cry. Like, you want to get me crying fast? I think I told you this last time. Like, Let's talk about God's goodness. Like mm -hmm. it, it is overwhelming. It literally keeps getting better and better. Like each day you walk, you're like, what? Like, no, I knew you were good, but no, you're, you're even better. And then like <laughs> something else happens. You're like, what? Like literally it just grows, right? Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Our understanding It's what's growing is our understanding of his goodness. Mm hmm I'm just so amazed by how good he is, right? And and I've heard people talk about this my whole life. And I'm just like, yeah, okay, whatever. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know what you're talking about. Like, I've never seen yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, he's like, good. Sure, he's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. um, no, but guys, like, he actually is a faithful, good, and loving father yeah. who has just paid the most expensive price for me, you know, for mm -hmm. me. Of all people. And I just, when I think about his goodness, 
I just can't help but like cry because like that God loves me. Yeah. The fulfillment that that brings is just unparalleled with anything else. And I just want that for everybody. Amen. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so thanks. Jesus is worth it, guys. Oh. The cost of following Jesus is worth it. It's worth it. So just one final question for you. How has prayer changed for you for? So I think I told you this before, but I used to think that in order to talk to God, it had to be a very like solemn, like respectful manner. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, Like you get on your knees, you have to close your eyes. You have to start Mm -hmm. with like, dear heavenly father, who is it? You know, whatever, whatever. Nah. I don't pray like that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> in, in fact, like I used to only pray in Spanish because like that was my first language. And in my okay. brain, subconsciously, like when I speak to my parents, that's who I respect the that's most in my life. Yeah. Sure. So like, obviously God is above them. So I would pray to him in Spanish as if he would hear me better that way. Like, no, nah, false, false, false. That's wrong, so wrong, interesting. Wrong. Yeah. Sure. Um, my prayer life has changed. I just talk to God all the time mm. as if he were my bestie, you know? I don't need to get on my knees to like pray and cry and weep and grovel. Mm. No, God hears my heart. Like, sure, I can show respect. And I love to go to my secret place and get on my knees and like turn the lights off in my closet and just talk to God and have like a one-on-one time without interruption. But I also talk to him throughout the day. And First John 5, 14 says, mm-hmm. if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. I know that God hears my prayer. Before I was so worried that like, well, I'm not doing it right. Or I'm not saying it right. Or sure. I'm not being respectful enough. No one has ever taught me how to pray. Like now I just know God loves me. He just wants to talk mm-hmm. to me like a friend. Yes. You know? And so it Mm -hmm. has changed a lot in that way. That's beautiful. Well, I just thank you so much for sharing. And if you haven't heard Flora's full testimony, it's on the Death to Life podcast, episode 51. 